Rebecca, and, and thanks, Bernie, and thanks the organizer for inviting me to this nice workshop. So, so I will introduce myself. I'm uh, uh, Enrico Lucinat. I'm a senior postdoc at the University of Florence, and I work at uh, CERM, CIRMP, which is the uh, Magnetic Resonance Center of Florence. And I'll show some examples of NMR, high-resolution NMR applied to, to human cells and specifically to monitor time-resolved, uh, real-time uh, cellular events. So first, a brief uh, introduction of uh, what is uh, uh, CERN-CIRMP. So it's both uh, a university uh, lab and an inter-university consortium, that's why it's double name, and it's uh, an Italian uh, core center of instructeric infrastructure. So it means that we give uh, uh, transnational access, much like uh, Diamond does and many other labs. So it's one of the largest uh, NMR labs in Europe and in the world actually, uh, consisting in um, 12 NMR spectrometers, one relaxometer, and then several other facilities. Uh, and it was, by the way, last year, the first one to, to have uh, uh, the installation of the 1.2 gigahertz NMR, which uh, is uh, uh, currently the highest uh, uh, commercially available uh, field for NMR spectroscopy. So. It's a, it's a huge center, and what I do is a very small part of everything that gets done here, uh, which uh, focuses on the development and application of uh, in-cell NMR methodologies. Uh, so what's in-cell NMR? It's a, it's a direct uh, way to obtain uh, information on macromolecules at uh, the atomic level or at the residue level, so at very high resolution, directly in the, in the living cells, which means that you get very uh, highly relevant information from a physiological point of view. And uh, that's kind of unique for such a, uh, for a technique like uh, NMR uh, spectroscopy and uh, has some very uh, interesting advantages compared to, to for example, cryo-ET tomography or the other methods that, uh, that we've also uh, saw today because we can work at physiological temperatures and we can see things in motions as they happen in real time. So it's a very powerful tool to get uh, biologically relevant uh, uh, structural information and information on the dynamics and on the kinetics of cellular processes. And it's also very powerful when you compare the in vitro NMR uh, classical characterization with what you get in the cell. So it can be applied to, to several types of processes like, like protein. Uh, you could determine protein structures for small enough proteins. You can uh, study protein-protein interaction, protein folding and maturation events. So uh, several interesting applications. Um, how can you do that? There are in these years, uh, several approaches have been developed uh, to, uh, to perform NMR. I will focus here briefly, introduce uh, the methods to perform in cell NMR on human cells, on cultured human cells. So, uh, so other groups have developed, uh, th there's uh, several methods that you can use to introduce your protein in the cells. And um, commonly people have relied on protein delivery by different methods like uh, self-penetrating peptides or toxins to form, pore forming toxins to permeate the cells or electroporation to, um, to introduce proteins which are purified from outside. Uh, we have uh, pioneered uh, an alternative approach which is much closer to, to the classical biotechnological um, uh, approaches that you use to produce proteins in E. coli. We transfect the cells with the DNA encoding the protein of interest and then we can induce the overexpression of the uh, protein of interest. And this uh, allows to skip purification steps. So sometimes it's even faster than any other method. And it's quite robust in terms of protein yield and the fact that it can be broadly applica applied to different uh, proteins without too much effort in optimizing the conditions. So these uh, are very complementary because you get advantages from both methods. And it's one more way to quickly also, I would say, produce samples for NMR analysis. Now for NMR, you need a lot of protein and you need a lot of cells. So I, I will then show you the, some of the issues that you will encounter when doing so. Um, but first, then I, I will talk about some recent development that we did here about uh, uh, could we apply in cell NMR to, to actually contribute uh, in the drug development pipeline? So in, in rational drug design, you must first uh, uh, screen uh, a protein when you know the structure of the protein and, and then find the in vitro ligands, hits that 
uh, that can bind and then you optimize these leads to get compounds with higher and higher affinity and all this happens in vitro. What happens when, then is that you start, you need to do cell-based assays and then animal assays, preclinical assays. So, and at that point, uh, all the libraries of eff effective uh, uh, inhibitors or ligands, whatever, to your protein uh, will start to, uh, to lose. I mean, there is, a, there is a huge attrition rate because at this point, uh, many uh, compounds will fail. And sometimes uh, even later, at later stages, they will fail in the clinical trials with a huge expense and cost. So, so could we improve this? Uh, that's the dream. Could we improve this pipeline and fit Intel and MR somehow, some way in between the lead optimization and the preclinical assays by actually combining the two and screen ligands directly in cells uh, in, with a structural uh, biology technique. So that was the dream. And uh, we uh, tried to, to tackle this, this challenge by, well, we first focused on a model protein, which is also a pharmacologically relevant target, actually, which is the human carbonic anhydrase, which is a very ubiquitous enzyme responsible for pH homeostasis and and uh, ions homeostasis, and, and it's involved in several pathologies because there's 15 isotopes of this protein in, uh, in humans. Uh, so this is a zinc, it's a metallic protein, it's a zinc bound uh, protein, and the zinc is uh, bound by, by three histidines. And these histidines have signals that we can identify in the NMR spectrum. So these are directly in cell NMR. For those not familiar with NMR, this is a, a proton nitrogen two dimensional correlation spectrum, which is very broadly used by uh, all N protein NMR spectroscopists to probe uh, any conformational and dynamic change in the protein backbone. Because what you get here is uh, cross peaks, uh, which tell you which are the chemical shift of the proton and nitrogen of the amide backbones, one for each residue of your protein. So if these move when you treat the molecule, when you chemically oxidize it, change it, or when you, uh, when you induce an interaction with a ligand or with another protein, you will get shifts in some of these peaks. And you can assign them to the actual uh, uh, residues in the backbone, which means that you get a map of the interaction. That's, why, that's where the residue resolution comes. Now, this is an actually in cell NMR. So we overexpress this protein in human cells. So we got a very nice uh, proton nitrogen correlation spectra where we could easily monitor ligand binding by looking at how the protein signals would move in the spectrum. What's more, uh, we could also exploit the fact that these protons in the active site and a few other protons close to the active site. Uh, uh, have a very particular chemical shift that uh, is very uh, is shifted uh, on the left side of the proton spectrum, so it's uh, it's shifted downfield, and uh, because they uh, because they lie close to this uh, uh, zinc ion, and what happens then is that you get these signals in a region of the proton spectrum that is uh, uh, free from any other background signal from the cells. So in a cell, you would have millions of different unique protons that would stand in the way in the spectrum, but this are very well resolved. So you can skip the N15 labeling and the, uh, the two-dimensional NMR and just use the proton NMR to probe for ligand binding. So here we can treat these uh, uh, cells with acetazolamide or methazolamide and see how the protein signals are changing when you get binding. So this is a very nice way to directly observe the binding to protein. At that point, we perform the screening with uh, some standard compounds and uh, a set of experimental uh, compounds here in uh, developed here in Florence by the Superan group. So we collaborated with a group that has a huge library of these compounds. We were free to play with any of these compounds and we could easily find out which of these compounds would bind the intracellular protein very efficiently in excess of ligand. So we treated the cells with an excess of ligand and they waited for one hour and then checked the spectra and we could see 100% binding. And then there were many others where we actually did not observe any binding whatsoever, except for very, very little amounts. And this, interestingly enough, this not, did not correlate at all with the, uh, with the uh, inhibition constant and therefore with the affinity constant of these compounds to the protein. So there is no correlation with the binding strength. It has to do with something else. And in this case, the um, hypothesis was that uh, the membrane permeability, the, that the ability of these ligands to reach the protein was different. 
we could then uh, uh, change, well, repeat the experiment by changing the amount of ligands that we incubated the, the cells with, and we got nice binding curves. So we could actually do that at different doses, and then we did that the same at different times of incubation, because we took into account the kinetics of, mem of protein binding and uh, uh, membrane diffusion. And Actually, it was uh, uh, possible to obtain this, uh, this dose and time dependent binding curves from which we derived uh, with a uh, diffusion model, simple diffusion model, the, um, uh, the permeability constant uh, experimentally derived for each of these compounds. Uh, so they are not really permeability constants in term because there is a term that accounts for the total membrane area of our cell sample. However, that is uh, assumed to be constant for all of them. So you can compare these numbers and you see that they are very different and some of them are actually not measurable because they are infinitely slow in our time uh, uh, interval. So then we compared with the, with the predicted value of uh, uh, membrane permeability and we found uh, quite a nice correlation in the fact that those with a very much lower log Kp uh, the, um, estimated uh, in, in predicted in silicon were the same compounds that for which we did not observe binding. And what's even more interesting is that uh, the uh, calculated uh, Kp in our experiments uh, correlates very well with the efficacy of these two compounds which are actually drugs. They are approved drugs against glaucoma, the dose, uh, the recommended dose for the treatment of glaucoma of these two drugs different, uh, uh, differs by around uh, uh, a factor of 10. And that's the same factor of uh, different uh, um, permeability constants that we measured. So there is clearly some correlation between the data that we get by inside NMR and the, eventually the, the efficacy of compounds. So we were very encouraged on going on with this kind of experiments. Now back to the principles of uh, uh, in cell NMR. Uh, one of the limitations when working at room temperature with a high density of cells is that the cells will start will starve and will will run out of oxygen. So they will start dying in a very short time, which is bad for NMR because NMR is intrinsically insensitive. So you need very often in vitro NMR you need time. So we needed more time and that's a kind of, of an obvious problem uh, for the NMR community and in fact uh, uh, there were several labs that proposed uh, uh, similar solutions. That is the uh, implementation of a flow bioreactor inside the NMR spectrometer. So basically we need to remove the toxic byproducts and provide fresh nutrients and oxygen to the cells at the same time keeping the cells inside the NMR tube, which is a glass tube, at a very high density that's important for the sensitivity. So we need that for two reasons. One is to be able to uh, record longer NMR experiments, and the second one is to perform real-time NMR. That's the thing I will show you. It's not going up, so. Stuck, okay. So, so we also implemented the similar bioreactor concept here in Florence by collaborating with Brucher, which is the same company that gives uh, that, that builds the spectrometers. They developed uh, a, a commercially available flow unit for inline reaction monitoring, and we have adapted that to enclose the cells in the NMR tube and uh, uh, flow the growth medium during the NMR experiments. So, so we had two. Uh, versions of these uh, bioreactors. So we, we built it in a modular way so you can change some components and adapt it to different requirements. So this is a version where the cells are kept in suspension inside the glass tube. That's good for so cells which grow in suspension. Uh, and within the tube there is a coaxial microdialysis membrane in which there is a coaxial flow of nutrients that diffuse through the membrane and reach the cells which are suspended here. In the second uh, version, uh, we entrap the cells, we embed the cells in agarose, but uh, in principle, uh, other more physiological uh, hydrogels could be used. And then we just flow the fresh nutrients and make them diffuse through the gel, through the agarose. So the cells are entrapped here and the flow uh, diffuses through the agarose. With the latter setup, 
we could maintain cell viability to very high levels uh, for up to three days, which is a, a huge improvement compared to a few hours. So this drive and blue abstains to check for cell viability and it was above 90% for three days. So this is the plot of cell viability. And, uh, and we could also follow the uh, metabolic uh, activity of the cells by measuring the beta ATP signal from phosphorus NMR, phosphorus NMR experiments. So all this uh, was very encouraging because we could see high metabolic constant metabolic activity for three days. Whereas when you turn out the flow, then you get uh, zero ATP in a few, in one hour or a few, few more. So, so then we did repeated the uh, ligand binding experiment by observing cells which overexpressed the carbonic anhydrase and then provide the ligands. And then you can see the sort of movie here. These are stacked plots of 1D spectra, the same that I showed before. And you can clearly see the point where the binding starts. And these are examples of single spectra. They are noisy because they are shorter than the, the previous ones. Uh, we then needed a way to analyze automatically this uh, large amount of 1D spectra instead of relying on simple signal integration because overlap here could create some problems. And we relied on um, MCR ALS, which is multivariate recurve resolution by alternate least square fitting algorithm, which is uh, mathematically is quite straightforward. It's implemented in MATLAB. And, uh, and there's a graphical user interface. So it's a, it's a very easy process and it just needs the series time series of spectra and a few initial information and uh, closure conditions and then it performs the fitting and it uh, retrieves the uh, pure spectral components which in this case are the free and the bound protein and the plots of concentration versus time which is what we were interested in too. so basically we could repeat this instead of making many cell samples we just used one sample of cells for many hours and then we monitored in real time the ligand binding. And uh, we also show that uh, this method is also applicable to two dimensional NMR, which is much more useful when you want to observe protein uh, um, conformational changes and not just ligand binding. So here you get a much more powerful way to observe changes at the single residue resolution. And uh, in both uh, cases, we could then uh, uh, fit these curves with uh, a kinetic model like a diffusion millimeter binding, which is the same that we observe uh, in the previous work. And uh, in this case, uh, different models could be applied. That, that depends on the type of system that one is interested in. So this is uh, quite a promising approach. And uh, we are now extending it to, uh, by again, going back to the two dimensional NMR, this time uh, we performed uh, amino acid type selective labeling and we only labeled with N15 the histidines coordinating uh, uh, the protein histidines. And these are the signals from the same region of spectrum that uh, you saw before, but it's resolved in two dimensions, which means that you can uh, uh, better resolve uh, uh, species, different species. So in principle, more than two species or ligands that, per that give very, very similar spectra can be uh, told apart. And that means that we can perform uh, experiments uh, with, by treating cells with multiple ligands, like two ligands at different concentrations, and uh, that opens uh, the possibility to perform uh, uh, competition binding experiments, which are a way to retrieve the actual uh, affinity constant of the ligands inside the cells. So with this, this was the last slide. This is an ongoing project and I hope I will be able to show even nicer results in a short time and i want to thank all the people who was invited uh, who is involved in this project uh, from florence and the collaborators and thank you all for your attention that's wonderful thank you very much enrico for uh...